Teddy Roosevelt spoke at the opening of the Capitol, and he said something to the effect of, let nothing happen in this place that can't be shown you know, in broad daylight. Um, and so he was speaking to corruption immediately. The architect of the Capitol was uh, imprisoned for graft on that building. So this is our history of corruption in Pennsylvania. When we go to Harrisburg to lobby, we park in a parking garage across the street from the Capitol. As we're leaving the parking garage, we walk past several parking spots that have signs that say things like reserved, Comcast, reserved, Shell Oil. They have parking spots reserved at the Capitol because they own that place. They own a seat at that table. And the public does not have a seat at that table. We are not being represented. See, I don't use the term walking a lot. I use the term march. I have military background, so I'm thinking march. Marching to me is swift movement. Walking is casual, just walking down the street. I'm marching for a cause. That's what I'm doing. We do long-term marching. You're talking to people, you're getting to know their stories, you're getting to know why they felt compelled to do something crazy, like march across the state. In 2009, I went and I worked in the Democratic National Committee as an intern, and they put me in the fundraising department. And there I saw the direct link between money and politics and policy. I saw the checks coming in from the health insurance industry, and then all of a sudden, the public option, which had 70% approval, disappeared. It was no longer on the table. I was diagnosed with MS shortly after I began college, and everything in my life became a lot harder, and not because of necessarily the MS. The fact that they're listening to someone profiting off of me being sick, rather than just me, is actually insane. We had an opportunity to pass a two-year window for justice for victims of crimes by the Catholic Church, sexual abuse and rape. It was an overwhelmingly popular bill with extreme public support, but these decisions are made behind closed doors without any consideration of the people that are affected. When common sense ideas that have majority support in Pennsylvania get to the legislature, they do not move. Nothing happens. And the reason for that is the money. Hitting that money wall and realizing, okay, I'm not getting anywhere with this, so what can we do that's bigger? The solution is to pass a wave of legislation, a wave of laws over the next few years to disconnect our government from special interests and to reconnect our government to we the people. Most people didn't know, including myself, that Pennsylvania is one of 10 states where your legislators can accept any sex gift, and they do. Meaning brand new cars, vacations, sports tickets, cash. Once a legislator tells us that how could he pay his mortgage if he didn't get gifts. We're working to limit campaign contributions. There are no campaign finance rules in Pennsylvania. That actually was brought up in the uh, committee hearing yesterday. Someone who was testifying said, They have a very specific limit. What is it, $2,300? And the legislators conferred, and they said, In Pennsylvania, there are no limits. Sure, yeah. So, um, go mm -hmm. for it, so. Right now, you can cut a check for $1 billion to any Pennsylvania state legislator. We have no limits on our campaign contributions at all. When corporations give money to politicians, they expect a lot in return, and they get a great return. It's the best investment you can make, is buying a politician. March on Harrisburg has four primary tactics. The first one is lobbying. Most people in Pennsylvania have never lobbied their state representative or their state senator. So when we go in, we're breaking down that barrier of separation between the public and our public servants. Lobbying is laying the groundwork. Um, it's developing relationship with legislators so that they know who we are and what we want. We have lobbied 250 out of the 253 legislators in our state. We started with very few co-sponsors for each of these bills and we ended up with a ton of co-sponsors. What politicians tell us all the time is that if we only say things nicely, if we only ask for things nicely, if we only like meet with them, if we only, if we only. Um, and so in this case with March on Harrisburg, we've been able to, to say no, we did. <laughs> sure did. The other side of lobbying is empowering people that are traditionally left out of that entire process. You know, who usually lobbies? Wealthy people, 
mostly rich white men. You learn so much, um, and you learn to have a voice, you learn to be brave, you learn a lot about government. You don't need to be an expert, you don't need to be dressed up, you don't need to talk fancy, you don't need to, you know, like, that is not what you should think of when you think of being able to talk to your representatives. They are, like, you are, the, you are their bosses, you are the people that pay their salaries. So when we bring all kinds of people, people that look like us, you know, to the Capitol who have never done that, it really is building the power of the poor and dispossessed and people that feel unrepresented. They are here all the time. And I think that they have garnered tremendous respect from the legislators, even when the, uh, it's respect and fear. Dozens of activists in our region are spending this rainy day outside all to send a message. Yes, they are. They've kicked off a 100-mile march to Harrisburg. Oh, I love to walk. Um, it was beautiful weather. Beautiful, but it was cold. <laughs> it was very windy. And everyone felt that we were taking a journey together with a purpose. So I was in good company. People come and march with us for a day, they come and march with us for 10 minutes, they come and walk with us for 10 miles, whatever it may be. And we walk and we talk, and that helps build the democratic community that we need to, to sustain a movement. Those conversations that you have, just sort of shifting back and forth with different people on the way, um, I just, it, was, it was invigorating, it was fun, I felt like I was getting a little crash course on the specifics of what March on Harrisburg was aiming toward. And also getting to talk to a few people and like having the curiosity of the people that were passing by, um, the curiosity of, of what's happening. Why are they taking the time and the effort to do this? When I first saw them, I, I just, I didn't even know what they were marching about. <laughs> and then when I found out about the gift ban and I started looking deeper into the corruption, I was just uh, outraged that people weren't outraged about that. These are small rural areas that typically don't see protests. So when they see a long line of people marching along the street, they ask what's going on. And they usually like what we say. A lot of people ask me, why do I do it? I just tell them that, look man, we're always crying about the man doing this and that to us, okay? But where are we at? You see me with all these guys here? How many of us are in here? Not many of us. Well, we need to join this. We need to get involved in this to make changes. You know, we can't keep talking and yelling at the TV. We need to get out there and yell at the people who truly make the laws. And when we show up as a march, when we've marched into the Capitol, it, it is certainly intimidating to leadership. One of our marches, it was well publicized that we were marching and would arrive in the Capitol. And lo and behold, there was nobody there. They had canceled session to avoid us. And that showed me how powerful they were that they would actually call off session because they knew that this young but mighty small group was coming and they damn well better be ready. We'd marched all this way, we'd lobbied for these bills for nearly a year, and our representatives run away from us. So that's when nonviolent civil disobedience becomes necessary. For the second day in a row, several members of the group March on Harrisburg were arrested at the state capitol. Lobbying only gets you so far. When we lobby, we know that we have the votes to pass our bills, but in Harrisburg, you really need the consent of the leadership. The group chanted outside Representative Darrell Metcalf's office. The group's asking for a meeting with the lawmaker to talk about a bill in Metcalf's committee that would ban unlimited gifts from lobbyists to legislators. And when lobbying the leadership, we often are just banging our heads up against a brick wall. It turns out the legislators don't really want to give up their power or their money. They are the guardians of the culture of corruption. They're the ones who up. rose through the ranks of a corrupt system. It's what keeps them in power. If you are going to refuse to meet with the people of Pennsylvania when you sit as the head of one of the most powerful committees in the legislature, then we're gonna have to do something to get your attention. Y'all weren't paying attention any other time. I really have to get arrested so that y'all can like look at me. Whenever change has been made, it's not just by advocacy and by people going visiting their legislators and lobbying. It's by large numbers of people rising up and making a ruckus. They don't want to look at these problems. 
And when you do nonviolent civil disobedience, we force the encounter. They have to look at it. They have to look at us. We're right in their way. We're sitting in their hallway. There's about a dozen protesters or so camped outside of Governor Wolf's home in Mount Wolf here. They are demanding he take action on gerrymandering. It's putting things on a very public sphere and calling them out in the media and saying, you know, are you going to stand on the side of corruption or are you going to stand with the people? The press paid attention, the Capitol paid attention. There was definitely a conversation about who are we, what are we doing, <laughs> and why are we doing it. We've seen time and time again that an act of nonviolent civil disobedience moves the ball forward, that advances our bills, it gets us more co-sponsors, it wins us the sympathy of somebody in leadership. It works every single time. Watch on Harrisburg plans to be back at the Capitol tomorrow. We're statewide, and when a legislator doesn't listen to us, we set up shop in their district, and we have people protesting in their district, and it works. But it takes a massive, grassroots, nonpartisan movement to do that. I see what we've been able to do with a small group in a relatively short period of time. If 25 people can do that, uh, what can 100 people do, and what can 1,000 people do? Lobbyists have an arsenal of weapons to get their way, but at the end of the day, there aren't that many of them. You know, there's a couple hundred lobbyists in Harrisburg. There are 13 million Pennsylvanians. When we show up in numbers, that changes the equation. I see the fervor building up. I see people recognizing, and I hear on TV a lot now, money in politics, get money out of politics. Redistricting. I'm hearing more and more about it. In the governor's debate, the first thing that was discussed within five minutes was gift limitations and corruption and gerrymandering. Has money become a corrupting influence in our political campaigns? I think it has. I, I think that's why I'm calling for campaign finance reform in Pennsylvania. I think we've really inserted something into the conversation politically across the state. Um, it's something that we should be really proud of. So I do believe the efforts are showing some fruits and I'm going to be involved until we do the best we can or until I can't walk anymore.